turn the conversation over to Maria Stort, who's going to provide some more information for us around advancing science and applying carbohydrate knowledge. Great. Thank you, Wendelin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Maria Stewart and I'm from Ingredion Incorporated where I work as a global technical director for R&D. I'm here actually as the chair of the Carbohydrates Committee and I'm very excited to share with you some of the recent activities. The Carbohydrates Committee addresses outstanding scientific issues through discovery, research tools, and translational messaging related to how carbohydrate-rich foods, food components, and formulations are associated with the consumption of consumption behavior, diet quality, and health outcomes. The Carbohydrate Committee is a large and active committee with 14 members. We are thankful for our academic advisors from the US and Canada, our government liaison, David Clearfield, who spoke and moderated yesterday's session. As we translate to, uh, transition to the next slide, I'd like to review some of the ways the committee is advancing science. So as noted, the committee is active in addressing scientific issues and advancing science. Here on the slide, we're highlighting some of the select current projects within the committee. Starting on the left side, we have a project comparing how short-term blood glucose response to food is measured and translated around the world. This project supports informed decision-making in both choice of method and translation on labels. The next project highlighted in the middle is on metabolic and physiological properties of rare sugars. Rare sugars have unique metabolic and physiological properties that distinguish them from more commonly consumed sugars like fructose and glucose. This project is to develop a narrative overview summarizing the properties of uniquely metabolized sugars as compared to the primary mono and disaccharides in the diet. The project on the right is actually one that was discussed a bit yesterday, standardizing method and development of normal values to measure human small intestinal and colonic permeability. Maintaining or restoring to normal gut barrier function is not currently recognized as a physiological benefit of fiber consumption, in part due to lack of agreement by experts in the field on how to define and measure normal gut barrier function in human nutrition research. Following an expert panel discussion, addressing this gap was prioritized by the Carbohydrate Committee. As we transition to the next slide, I want to also set up the second presentation in this session and share yet another one of the many projects that the committee is undertaking. As we hear much more about in the next talk, the Carbohydrate Committee is also proud to have supported the Dietary Fiber Database. The database project was focused on systematically compiling and providing access to peer-reviewed science linking dietary fiber intake in humans to one or more of the nine potential health benefits. So without further ado, I want to hand the presentation over to Dr. Barbara Lyle to introduce Dr. Nicola McEwen. Hello, good morning. So um, my name is Barbara Lyle and I'll be on and off today as the moderator for this first session and then I'm going to be doing a wrap up at the end of the entire symposium in which in about uh, less than five minutes, we're going to go through front to back uh, the key points that were made, and I have a surprise on my last slide. So uh, make sure that your calendar is open because you don't want to miss a surprise. That's the very last thing on the agenda. Um, my role um, in working with the symposium has been to organize the scientific sessions. And my other role with ILSI is actually as the uh, nutrition advisor to the Carbohydrate Committee. And it's my pleasure as part of that um, responsibility to work with all of the researchers uh, that do projects that have been funded by ILSI, and that includes the fiber database. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, a pre-recorded uh, session uh, overviewing the fiber database and then Nicola McEwen and Kara Livingston will join us to answer questions that you may have. And again, I just want to encourage you to be submitting your questions while you're listening to the presentation so that they are ready to be asked at the end and you don't miss out because yours is at the end and we don't get to it. So motivating factor to be submitting your questions as we go. Thank you and I'll see you in a couple minutes.
So I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak today and acknowledge my project manager, Cara Livingstone, and my colleague, Dr. Larry Purnell, who helped with the data visuals. So over the next 20 minutes, I'll provide the justification of why we needed a fiber database, how it was developed, and what data it contains. I'll then cover some um, information on how to access the database and the application of this database, why you would want to use it. And I'll end with some considerations that you need to take into account if you're working with this database. So fiber, as we know, is not a single entity. There are multiple ways to group or classify uh, fiber as illustrated in this figure taken from our 2016 publication. Fiber can be classified based on a group of physically related compounds, uh, for example, non-starch polysaccharides or resistant starches, or grouped by their physical characteristics, including solubility, viscosity, and fermentability. Fiber can also be synthetic or purified fibers in the form of supplements or enriched ingredients, or can be described based on food sources such as legumes or, fi or cereals. What I didn't appreciate when we started to work on the database and extract the data on the fiber is that researchers use different terminology or names to describe similar fibers, and there are actually hundreds of unique fiber descriptions in this database. In addition to the huge number of different fiber types, we also know that research on the health benefits of fiber continues to grow with an average of 50 publications per year. What's important to note is that this graph captures only the number of dietary intervention studies in fiber. So we're not capturing data on animal or observational studies. And what you can see is that the research is con continuing to steadily increase. And as an example of how the research field is continually changing, this image shows fiber types linked to some aspect of gut health and it shows the variation in the number of publications by fiber type over the time period of 1975 to 2017. As you can see, the database reflects evolving research in the field. For example, research on inulin and oligosaccharides has continued to increase steadily. With this background of the complexities of fiber in mind, you can see why there was a recognized need for a centralized resource to house the research. So ILSI had put out a call for researchers to work on a publicly available database, which we responded to uh, with our colleague, Dr. Mei Chung in uh, 2013. And the result is now that we have a publicly available comprehensive database housing the peer reviewed intervention studies linking fiber intake in humans to physiological health outcomes. As I mentioned, we started the project in 2013 and published the first version in 2015 with data extracted from nearly 900 papers. Since then, we've been consistently updating the database and today we have data extracted on over 1,100 uh, uh, published studies. To give you a brief background on the creation of the database, much like you do with the first steps of a systematic review, we created a search criteria. And what is important to share with you is that this search was restricted to Medline. So just to note, we did not search other databases such as Embase and Cochrane. After we conducted our Medline search, we identified almost 12,000 publications. And so we refined our inclusion and exclusion criteria as shown in the slide. And in the interest of time, I won't go through each of these inclusion and exclusion criteria, but we did refine the search. And even still, our initial screening of the potential literature of interest included over 7,000 abstracts. So these abstracts were screened using Abstractor, which is a web-based tool that allows you to upload literature and easily screen abstracts. The included abstracts were then reviewed at the full text level, and if eligible, data was extracted into our database. Sorry, I just want to point out though, so this, as I mentioned the summary, we began uh, with version one, 
um, which had approximately 900 papers. But as I mentioned now, we're coming out with version six. Um, that's due to be released in January 2021. Um, and that will have over 11,000 published papers. Our data extraction process aimed to capture PICO data, which stands for population, intervention, comparator, and outcome. Uh, with respect to population, we collected data on age, gender, BMI, and health status. Uh, for the intervention and the comparator, we captured data on fiber type um, and the uh, control, followed by dose duration and how the fibers were administered. And then the main focus was on capturing data for the Vahuni 9 outcomes, which I'll touch upon later. The data I'm presenting here is based on version 5, which is our most recent publicly available database capturing data through May 2018. The majority of the studies were crossover, with 62% falling in the study design. <clears throat> and with respect to sample size, the majority of the intervention studies have been between 10 and 49 study participants. What is interesting is, as you can see from this graph, is that there's been a steady increase in the number of parallel studies over time, uh, with a corresponding increase in sample size. So along the y-axis, you have the sample size, and uh, along the x-axis, time. And so study design preference is uh, certainly changing over time, which is good, um, and to include more study sample sizes, which is good. So in terms of study population, with respect to the age group, the majority of the studies have been conducted in adults, uh, mostly healthy populations, some amongst people with diabetes and high lipid levels. But it's important to note that we intentionally excluded many populations with diseases such as infectious disease, cancer, or kidney disease. This is an interesting plot um, that shows a bias in the papers towards recruitment of male study participants over females. Um, this was on, conducted on a small sample of papers that focused on the gut microbiota and years are grouped on the x-axis. So a positive value in green indicates more randomized controlled trials that enrolled uh, male volunteers over females at the time period, while the pink shows that more papers enrolled female volunteers over, uh, over male. And what you can see is that um, if you come along the uh, following the arrow, as you move across time, you see that the bias is less. And so this is another important attribute of study design, uh, aiming to recruit uh, equal numbers of males and females. With respect to outcomes, as mentioned, we collected data on a variety of outcomes, nine of which were identified as important at the ninth uh, Vahuni Fiber Symposium in 2010. And later, uh, phone outcomes were added as a 10th outcome due to the growing interest in the field. The top two outcomes in the current database are total and LDL cholesterol uh, in the maroon, and postprandial and glycemia are representing 18%, followed by weight and adiposity and satiety. And currently, there are only 5% of the included papers in the database that look at bone-related outcomes. So now that you know what is captured in the database, where is the database housed? So this database is available in two places. The first is on the ILSI North America website, as shown here, with the corresponding link at the bottom of this slide. Uh, the, on the LC page, it will give you the objectives of the database. You'll see that there's uh, a link to the database, a link to the user manual, some data information on the database overview, and the rationale and methods that were used. It can also be found on the Systematic Review Data Repository, which is hosted by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, as shown here. Um, so SRDR is a tool for extraction and management of systematic reviews and meta-analysis data, and it's publicly available. 
and it houses um, not only our uh, study, but a number of other evidence-based databases just like ours. Both the LC site and SRDR will allow users to download the database in an Excel format. Uh, the format does differ slightly between the two platforms, um, but it will uh, essentially be uh, similar. And once you download it, uh, we encourage you to simultaneously download uh, a copy of the user manual. And this user manual is updated annually along with the database. And what is important is that this data uh, manual also contains the data dictionary so that you'll have a better understanding of what those variables, uh, titles and, and names are reflecting in the database. So while the data is downloadable in Excel format, the users may choose to review and work with the data in Excel. I do want you to note that there is the option of using some more sophisticated uh, platforms for analysis, such as um, R or SAS. And we ourselves prefer to use um, these statistical uh, software when we're doing uh, grouping similar fibers, for example, and relating them to outcomes or conducting actual analysis. Now, some of you in the audience may just be interested in reviewing the literature on a particular fiber. And in fact, we have heard from researchers in the field that the database can be an excellent source for students, as well as supplementing searches used to conduct systematic review or meta-analysis. Again, on the ILSI uh, webpage, you can find a link that will allow you to search um, the database. So this is a relatively new feature and we're continue to work on this to make it even more user friendly and efficient. But as you can see on this slide, you're able to indicate some basic search parameters of interest. For example, the design, the fiber type, outcome, and the page will uh, provide you then with a list of papers in the database uh, meeting your specific, specified criteria. Uh, it'll also allow you to do an open search. So with an open search, if you just wanted to type in the fiber that you're particularly interested in, you would do so here. And then what it will do is download um, a list of PMIDs uh, with the corresponding paper uh, details. And then if you go over here to the right and you want to view the details, that will bring you to our data entry screen and it will have some additional information there for you. So now that we've uh, discussed um, you know, what's in the database and where you can find it, let's uh, change course here and talk a little bit about why we would use the database. So the database can be used to initiate other work. It can serve as a starting point to conduct systematic reviews, for example. And this will save the researcher time and it is cost efficient because we've done a lot of work with the extraction of the data up front. It can also be used to identify gaps in existing literature. And for people who are doing systematic re reviews, it can also be used the opposite way to check against a search you've already conducted to ensure that no literature was missed. Finally, it may be particularly useful for food manufacturers, health researchers, and organizations in evaluating the health benefits of different fiber sources or synthesizing evidence for food labeling. And so we ourselves applied the database to summarize existing research on dietary fiber and the gut microbiota using a metho methodology called evidence mapping. So instead of a specific targeted question, an evidence map aims to determine the research landscape of a topic area. And so we use the database to address the following objectives. To describe the existing research on dietary fiber in the gut microbiota, and then using this methodology to identify potential gaps in the research and highlight areas where new hypotheses may be addressed in future studies. Uh, in this publication, which came out in 2017, we'd used data from the version one of the database. 
And at that time, you can see that the distribution of different dietary fiber types uh, were examined in relation to the microbiota studies. We did identify 47 unique fiber type or type of fiber descriptions, and we collapsed these broadly uh, speaking into 11 categories. So the top three fiber groups consist, uh, considered to impact gut health or that we're reporting um, in relation to gut health were the uh, oligosaccharides followed by resistant starch and then chemically synthesized uh, fibers. We then set out to visually summarize the research in the field and we created a weighted scatter plot of the microbiota outcomes by fiber group uh, in relation to bacterial composition, uh, short chain fatty acid production, uh, colonic fecal pH, breath gas excretion and other fermentable markers, fermentation markers. And so what this plot shows is that there are some continued active areas of interest. So we can see, for example, that large numbers of relatively larger studies, and the scale for the studies is along here, uh, where you can see along the bottom of the slide, a larger bubble uh, indicates a much larger sample size, and then as the size of the bubble goes down, they are much smaller. And so you can see that, um, a large number of relatively larger studies have been published on bacterial composition and oligocide interventions. What this database, database doesn't house is the actual results. And however, as mentioned earlier, it can be used as a starting point to address a research question. And in this publication, Dr. Sawicki summarize the characteristics of oligosaccharide interventions and the direction of evidence on bacterial composition. So she used the da database uh, to narrow down her search and then once she identified those papers was able then to extract more information that was relevant to her publication. She also presented a visual display on the intersection between fiber type and other physiological health outcomes captured in um, this evidence map that was focused on the gut microbiota uh, or gut health outcomes. Not surprisingly, GI health, which includes measure of fecal bulking and lactation, laxation um, and transit time uh, were frequently studied uh, along with gut microbiota. Uh, but there was less evidence, for example, with respect to satiety and adiposity. At the time of this publication, there was only one study that had examined bone health in the context of dietary fiber and the gut microbiota. And another interesting observation that I haven't presented is that there was no longer duration, so no studies longer than four weeks um, on resistant starch. And so for companies that are focused on one particular fiber, using this methodology uh, may be useful in identifying the shifts in the research and the potential gaps in the field. So as I wrap up this talk, I wanted to end with some things that you'll need to consider when you're working with this database. So first of all, the search criteria, sorry, the search, search strategy was restricted to Medline and searching secondary sources may be recommended depending on your objective. The database does not specifically address study quality, and while the majority of studies captured the isolated effects of fibers, some studies may be confounded by other attributes of food, such as glycemic index. We entered the fiber descriptions as they were reported in the paper, and so you as a user will need to ensure that you are capturing your fiber exposure from all published papers that may have used different um, terminology to describe the fiber of interest. Uh, the database, as we mentioned, is limited to 10 health outcomes. So again, depending on your objective, you may need to conduct, conduct additional searches. And it does not incorporate the results or the direction of the evidence. Having said that, the strengths of this database are uh, it provides um, uh, a, flexible up, uh, a flexible cost and time efficient um, app use of the data. Uh, what's nice about the database is that it's updatable annually and uh, it will allow you to work with visualization uh, of body of literature on a body of literature. 
So with that, I'd just like to thank my uh, collaborators. It certainly takes a village, um, and so a heartfelt thank you to all those involved in the project, in particular CAR, our project uh, and data manager. And so I'll end here to answer questions. I know that time is tight, uh, so if we don't get to answer your question, please do reach out by email to CARA or myself, and we'll be happy to respond to any questions that you may have. And thank you for your attention. With that, uh, CARA and Nicola will be coming online, and we will be going through some answers to questions. I think we'll get started while we wait for uh, Nicola's webcam to come up. Uh, there she is. All right, so I'm gonna ask a couple questions of you first about the actual fibers in the database. Uh, so the first is if both added and naturally occurring fibers are included, and if so, um, how do you quantify the amount of fiber in a study when it includes naturally occurring that's maybe a little harder to uh, quantify than someone who's measured out and added uh, fiber. And we don't hear you, Nicola, at least I don't. Hmm, still don't. Um, so maybe Kara, do you have? Yeah, so in terms of the doses, we basically just extract what is presented in the paper. So however, and that's kind of our rule of thumb across the whole database is um, we just extract into the database what the authors present in the paper. So depending on how the authors choose to present the dose is how it would be in the database. So a lot of times um, it'll be like total fiber and then sometimes if they in the paper go into the detail of pulling out that specific like if it's a combination or something, that specific component of the fiber, that's what will be extracted. So um, it really depends. And that's why, you know, in the user manual, we do encourage people, if you have a specific interest in something like that with respect to dose, to, it is always good for a user to go back to the original paper because that could, you know, answer the question of how, the, how it was presented in the paper and then therefore how it was extracted into the database. Thank you. And Nicola, can we do a quick sound check? You yes, have your I'm microphone back. button? Oh, good. Yes, okay, thanks. Yes, All thanks, right, sorry. second question related to the fibers specifically. Um, is there a, a table with the synonyms of how a particular fiber might be called different things? Um, could be generically described in a paper. It could be using a brand name. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there's been things like somebody describes it as uh, pee holes, but it's actually fiber from pee holes. So can you talk a little bit more about the intricacies yeah. of how you handled those ambiguities and yeah. uh, putting so, them together? So as Cara kind of alluded to, and we, you know, we um, extracted the information from the papers as it was described in the papers. And then during this process, recognizing that, you know, a fiber may have different descriptions and different names, we have in the user manual um, listed out where we see the so, you know, for to your example, if it was a particular P fiber but and was described some other way, we tried to show how to do a search to find uh, the comparable or the same fibers using different names. Um, and having said that, that's where if um, folks are using the database and they are looking specifically for their fiber and note that it's not um, being captured in, it'll be captured but maybe not described in our manual, we, we're constantly updating that manual to help other users identify the same fibers. Okay. Um, so another one that's a little bit more related to the fibers specifically, but can you talk a little bit more about the types of oligosaccharides that were covered in the review that you showed as an illustrative example linking to the microbiome? Mm, that's a great question. Um, off, you know, we did, as you can see, we did group them um, in a broad category. Um, and in the publication, we have broken down what that uh, composition, the distribution of the different types, types of oligosaccharides within that category. So if I could refer the, that's a great question, the person who asked to the paper, it will have, I just can't remember offhand, the distribution um, of how we grouped, the, of what was grouped within that category. 
Okay. All right, now I wanna talk a little bit about health outcomes. Um, and we have a question that's um, kind of two parts here. So I'm gonna actually read it to you. So the first part is, although short chain fatty acids are not currently considered a health benefit, they are a physiologic outcome. Um, so has there been, uh, how are you handling capturing that in the database? And if not, um, then the question is, at what point do, is there a decision made to add an, a new outcome like that? Cara, do you want to talk about the outcomes there and how we capture them? Yeah, so um, so I think, Barbara, my understanding, right, the question was how are short-chain fatty acids captured basically as outcomes? Yeah, so that is, um, we have a Vahuni outcome category, which captures short-chain fatty acids and fermentation. So we collect two outcome measures. So one is the detailed outcome, um, which if you've used the database, you'll know it's like, specifically how it was presented in the paper. So whether it was short chain fatty, fatty acids or some type of marker fermentation, and then we group it also in the database to a broader group. And that I think is useful for helping people just kind of get a big overview of what's available within those nine Bahuni outcome groups. Um, so short chain fatty acids are captured um, there. And so you could search by that or you could search by the overall group. Um, I'm not sure if this is answering then, the question, but it is. Yeah. And then and the second part was yeah. how do you add a new outcome? Like if 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 there's a new outcome, you talked about bone, and there was only one study, but now there's more. How do you decide and prioritize adding a new outcome? Yeah. Um, so that was very much you know uh, solicited by a request from LC at the time to include bone as an outcome because that was an emerging area of interest. And so with that, you know, as the database evolves um, and or if groups are interested in including, we are we would go back and extract the data um, on a outcome that we may have missed um, because it wasn't one of those 10 outcomes. But we did um, we did also extract data that's not necessarily in the publicly available database um, on other outcomes. We did in a very crude way try to capture if there were other outcomes. Um, so it would facilitate this kind of question, can you go back um, and include our outcome of interest? So it's something that's feasible. Okay. And then can you clarify um, again, just I know we've you talked about this, but just to clarify again where the database uh, can be found free, no no charge, um, as well as talk about the annual update plan. Like how do you how often do you update it? How many papers in general do you see per year coming in? Yeah. Um, so the database is housed in two places, ILSI, uh, on the uh, Carbohydrate Committee web page. Um, and then it's also available in SRDR, which was where we extracted the data, um, the platform that we used to actually um, create user-friendly uh, our data for our data entry folks, um, where they could extract the data easily. Um, so they're the two locations. And we are updating it annually every year. Um, thus far, uh, with uh, approximately 50 papers, 50 to 70 papers, I would think, Carl, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think yeah. in our next version, I think you have 80 papers or so to update. There will be it, a so. little more in the next version, just because this this last version just timed out. It's going to be a year and a half rather than a year update. So, But yeah, Nicola, like 50 to 70-ish, 80-ish yeah. papers. And I, I know in my presentation, I referred to it as 11,000 entries. If we were still doing that, Cara would be <laughs> working every hour. Still under. Yeah. Um, so we've, <laughs> yeah. Over, we've over 11,000. Still 1,100. <laughs> yeah. Um, so can you comment, let's say a paper gets published in the middle of a year, about how long does it take before it shows up in the database? So that's kind of getting at the timeliness of the yeah. literature that's in a published database at a given time. Yeah, so like I'll use the example for this year. So that um, like when I start this year's update, so it'll be a search from last, so January 2020, sorry, January 2020 through December 2020 would be the update for number seven, version seven. So we would typically do the literature search in like maybe February. So if a paper was published like on December, like late December 2020, it may not show up, it may not be indexed in PubMed yet to show up on that search like just a month or two later. 
Um, but then we'll typically run the search again just to check if anything else has come in, like in March or April. So I'd say if something's published at the very end of a year, it, there's a chance it may not come in. But I think overall, Pub, they are indexed in PubMed pretty quickly. So if if the update is covering from, say, like January of a year through the whole year to the end of the year in December, we feel like we probably do capture most of those papers. And if any are missed because they're not indexed in time, they would come in on the next version. Yeah. for the following year. Yeah. And these are um, papers published in English, or what happens if the paper is published in a different language but the abstract was given in English? Um, if the paper is not in English, it, we've had not many, but one or two of them. If the paper is not in English, then we obviously we don't include it. Um, if the abstract is in English, we will try to get the paper in English, but there's been a few cases where it's not available, so it's excluded. Okay, and then last question here, as we're going into our ending here, is, um, you know, we've had some questions come in about um, the specificity of the results for the health outcome and whether or not someone doing a systematic evidence review needs to augment from the database. Um, can you explain the rationale for what you did include? Well, summarize what you did include. I know you already did, but just to ground everyone, and then explain why it is you made the decision to uh, quantify or not at the level you did? Yes, yeah, so that publication um, back a few years ago, uh, it, you know, we set out really to illustrate how we might be able to utilize the database in the context of evidence mapping. And the purpose of evidence mapping, it's not like uh, conducting a systematic meta-analysis. It's meant to be a much broader uh, picture of the landscape without going down into the specifics. Um, and so one of the way, one of the reasons we grouped um, them as we did was in part due to the variation in the number of fibers. We tried to just group them as best we could to do this visual um, to illustrate how the database might be used um, with the idea that you could take uh, different fibers and then look at the intersection between the fiber types um, and two outcomes, it's in this case, um, fermentation or gut microbiota and how that would intersect with other outcomes, just again to get a global picture of the landscape. Um, so it's very different than doing a meta-analysis where, um, you know, you would take into consideration um, also the, 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 the results in the context of the fibres. So it is somewhat broad, um, you know, for example, resistant starches, we know that not all resistant starches are going to have the same effect. And yet in our database, we did categorize them as resistant starch to give the reader some idea of how much, how, much, how much data we had collected in terms of the different fibers. And then within, for example, resistant starch, how many publications were in that overall context of that um, fiber or type. So. So, Kara and Nicola, is there any last thing that you're wishing I had asked and, and you want to comment on? And I also, Nicola, want to just make sure that you um, have a minute here to give your disclosures. I meant to ask you that first. And I know yep. uh, we had talked yeah. about that. So if you could give your wrap-up uh, disclosures and anything else you want to say. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I apologize for that. So my disclosures are that I've received funding from General Mills, uh, P&G, and LC. And my, um, I guess, you know, what I would... I uh, want to share with the audience is that this database is available and we're available to help uh, you navigate uh, the downloads and the data analysis. Um, and also we would really welcome feedback if you're working with the database and you notice any discrepancies or you find that there are papers that aren't included. At the initial launch of this, Barbara knows too that we got lots of feedback, you know, cross-checking where why publications weren't in and giving justifications why we excluded them so we're we're here to assist in any way we can Kara's shaking her head yes any more or yeah i think too like along what nicholas said inter as someone had asked about grouping fibers like if you're working with a specific fiber and you find other fibers that would be useful to group together in your search that would be great to hear about too because um, that's stuff we could include in the user manual for other users going forward. Great. So just to wrap, the database will be updated in uh, with this annual update in early 2021. It is all human data. It is uh, 10 health outcomes uh, added and intrinsic fiber, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
the intrinsic as well as added fibers. And with that, we're going to turn this over to Wendelin for instructions on what's next on our agenda. Thank you. Absolutely. And thanks, everybody. And thanks, Nicola and Kara. Really great insights. And thank you, Barbara, for helping moderate this session. So right now we're going to go into a break, um, obviously, with everything being online. We need to make sure that folks are encouraged to stand up take a stretch, et cetera. So we're gonna go on to a break until 10 a.m. Eastern time. So um, go ahead, go ahead and get some coffee, go stretch, et cetera, and enjoy your break. Thanks.